So having defined the basic timing constraints, the max delay and the min delay, we can now go over to a static timing analysis example and see how these are put to work. So we're giving this synchronous network. And in the synchronous network, what we see here is we have these logic paths. We're going to say that we have this flip-flop over here. We have this combinational block, which has several different paths. The maximum path is 1.2 nanoseconds. The minimum path through it is 250 picoseconds and this uh, flip-flop. And so we have a start point over here that goes through and reaches here. We can call that path one. If we go from, from this guy, it's a start point that ends at this guy, and that would be called path two in this case. There's only a single um, uh, start and end point in each of these areas, but the delay um, has a maximum and a minimum value again through this logic block. And um, path two, uh, I mean, we see that flip-flop uh, three over here, it has a feedback uh, path that goes to flip-flop one, so that causes us to have this path number three over here. Um, and we see that it has a maximum delay in its logic block of 700 picoseconds and a minimum delay of 200 picoseconds. Furthermore, we're given that the TCQ, the T setup, and T hold of all of these uh, flip-flops are the same, um, and we don't have any jitter. We're going to uh, neglect the jitter in this um, in this exercise. Plus, another thing I just want to say that, of course, we have TCQ, LH, and HL, and the same for setup and hold in there, um, different conditions for fast uh, corners, slow corners, and so forth. We're going to uh, just make a simple case and not show all of that. If you want to go deeper into what the actual TCQs, T-setups, T-holds, and so forth for different cases are, um, please refer to my Digital VSI design course where I explain that when I discuss uh, standard cell libraries and the Liberty format. Um, just another thing that in addition, we are uh, given over here that uh, there are there is skew between the clock arrival at the different flip-flops. So we have this skew over here, which is between clock two and uh, uh, between the arrival at flip-flop 2 and the arrival at flip-flop 1, and it's actually minus 100 picoseconds, so it arrives at clock 2 100 picoseconds before it arrives at 1. And we um, also have skew between clock 3 and clock 1, and pay attention that this is between these two, even though there's no path between them, that's how it's defined, and it's, it arrives 50 picoseconds here after it arrives here. So let's write the timing constraints of this thing, and we'll start um, with uh, path number 1. So again, path number 1 is the path that is over here. And what we can see with path number one is that we have a TCQ, we have the maximum delay through uh, the logic block, which is 1.2 nanoseconds, and we have the setup time of the flip-flop over here. That's going to be our launch path. What about the capture path? Well, here we have the uh, maximum uh, frequency or uh, the, the, the worst case uh, period that we're allowed to, to, to do is, is going to go through here. That's a big T. And it has to add to it the skew between the two blocks, which is, of course, equal to T skew 1. So we're going to get T1, which is the, the worst case um, period uh, between these two flops, plus T skew 1 is going to be larger than T CQ plus T, the, the maximum T uh, um, the propagation through this block um, plus the T setup and it's going to come out that T1 has to be larger than 1500 picoseconds or the maximum frequency is 666 megahertz. Now we can go over to the second path which is going to between, be between the second flip-flop and the third flip-flop and here again we have the TCQ, the worst case logic delay which is 800 picoseconds and the uh, setup time of this flip-flop but now what about our um, our skew? So again our skew was defined uh, kind of strangely um, always relative to the clock source which is the clock that reaches flip-flop one. Remember that skew is the arrival time at the capture um, register minus the arrival time at the uh, launch register. So it's going to be um, T, T skew 2 minus T skew 1. That's going to be the skew between these two guys. So we're going to get here the T2 plus the skew, which is T skew 2 minus T skew 1, has to be larger than T CQ plus the maximum logic delay plus the setup. And that's going to give us a constraint that T2 is larger than 850 picoseconds or 1.17 gigahertz. And path three, in a similar fashion, is going to go from uh, clock number three, the path that loops around here, back into flop number one. And uh, the logic delay is the worst case logic delay is the 700 picoseconds. And of course, we have the TCQ and T setup. What about the clock? Well, here, remember, the capture clock is this guy this time, and its arrival time is zero. 
whereas the capture the launch clock is this guy its arrival time is t skew 2 so the skew is going to be 0 minus t skew 2 so t3 plus 0 minus t skew 2 is larger than tcq plus t max um, which is 700 picoseconds plus T setup, and that's going to give us a constraint that T3 is larger than 950 picoseconds, or the maximum frequency is 1.05 gigahertz. Now, we look at all of these three constraints, and we know that we always have to take the worst case, which is the slowest path. The slowest path was uh, path number one. That's called the critical path, and it um, constrains us that we cannot clock our synchronous system higher than 666 megahertz. What about hold? So we have to also um, look at hold. And now I'm just going to show you something uh, a bit different in exercise wise. Let's say that TSQ1 and TSQ2 are not given, but I want to find what the values of the hold can be. So again, I'm going to have to write down for each path the hold constraints. Okay, um, so we saw that the whole, the, the capture path for path number one is um, just TSQ1. Okay. So we know that uh, the capture path plus the hold constraint, that's going to be our capture path, t skew one plus t hold um, uh, of the second flip-flop. That's going to be have to be larger than, uh, I mean smaller than, uh, t cq plus the minimum delay through here, which is 250 picoseconds, okay? And that comes out to, to constrain us that t skew one is smaller than 300 picoseconds. So that gives us a first constraint through that. Now, what about the second path? At the second path, again, what is our skew over here? It's going to be t uh, skew 2 minus t skew 1 uh, plus t hold, of course, is our capture path. Okay, so t skew 2 minus t skew 1 plus t hold is going to be smaller than, again, t cq plus the minimum delay through here, 150 picoseconds. And the constraint is going to come out that t skew 2 minus t skew 1 is going to be smaller than 200 picoseconds. So right now we have two, um, uh, two uh, constraints. Let's look at path number 3. And again, path number 3, the skew is going to be 0 minus t skew 2. Okay, and we're going to go through this 200 picosecond minimum path. So we get 0 minus t skew 2 plus t hold 1 is smaller than t skew, uh, tcq plus the minimum, which is 200 picoseconds. And we get uh, the constraint that t skew 2 is going to be larger than 250 um, picoseconds. Okay, so what are our constraints in the end? We get that t skew 2 is going to be larger than, um, 250, uh, than minus 200 in 50 picoseconds, and we get that TSQ1 is going to be smaller than 300 picoseconds, plus we also should have that TSQ2 minus TSQ1 um, have to be uh, uh, smaller than 200 picoseconds, and we need to meet those in order to make sure that our um, um, system uh, meets hold. Now, saying that, we can go and say that we can play around with TSQ1 and TSQ2 to maximize our frequency. This is something called useful skew. And how are we going to do that? So essentially, remember when we talked about pipelining, what we wanted was to take our big pipeline and break it into equivalent size blocks. And then if this and this and this and this and this are equal, we can put the, um, the frequency to, to make the period to be exactly equal to all of them. If one of them is longer than the rest, we have to make the period much longer. And then these guys are going to be waiting for each clock cycle. So what our plan is actually to make all of the patterns that's equal. So what we want to do now, essentially, is to equalize the, the whole, um, the, the delay through all three paths. If we can do that by playing with uh, TSQ1 and TSQ2, and this is something that is really done, then we can get to a maximum frequency. So how can we do it? Well, we know that the real delay through the whole thing is actually the TCQ plus the TP max plus the T setup, right? TCQ plus TP max plus T setup and TCQ plus TP max plus T setup. That's how, that's the amount of time it takes for the logic to go all the way around regard if the clock was ideal, right? If we didn't, uh, you know, okay. So basically we get uh, the total delay is three TCQ plus TP max of all three of these plus three times T setup. And that comes out 3.3 .3 nanoseconds. Um, we can also actually cancel out the TCQ and T setup because they were given as uh, equ equivalent here, but uh, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so what, what we want to do basically is find out how we can get all the delays to be 1.1 nanosecond. Okay, um, 
So if we can do that, we're going to say, listen, uh, uh, the, the clock period is 1.1 nanosecond, but we have the, the skew. And we already wrote down our constraints before. So if the clock period is 1.1 nanosecond plus t skew 1, or 1.1 nanosecond plus t skew 2 minus t skew 1, or 1.1 nanosecond of plus 0 minus t, uh, t skew 2 with the constraints of the three paths, we can solve this uh, set of equations and we find out that if t skew 1 is 300 picoseconds and t, uh, t skew 2 is 200 picoseconds, then everything is good and we, uh, we will arrive at a period of 1.1 nanoseconds, which will be the best case that we can do um, if we look before our um, uh, um, our best uh, our, our best frequency was 1.5 nanoseconds with the skew that was given, um, and and the other point is that we need to meet these two constraints that uh, t skew two is larger than minus 250 and the t skew one is smaller than 300 and what we found out over here is that uh, we got exactly t skew 1 is 300 and t skew 2 is positive so it's fine okay so that's the type of an example uh, that we can try and play around with there it's easy to make millions of these examples but in real life we actually hit um, this uh, that we have to make um, timing analysis in this way we have uh, algorithms that will that you can refer to my digital VSI design course to see how this is done on large um, graphs that have millions of these timing paths but in general this type of a uh, of an example is what we actually look at our timing reports and try to solve all the time when we do um, physical implementation so just for acknowledgments before um, ending this uh, lecture, um, a lot of the stuff is taken from Rabbi, uh, you know, uh, Rabbi Chandra Kassan and, uh, and Bora, um, which is a great book, even though it's pretty old by now. Um, Westin Harris's CMOS VLSI Design and some other lectures that uh, are found around the web. So uh, I hope you enjoyed and come back for lecture number eight.